Hey everybody, welcome back to our weekly podcast. Uh, my name is Patrick Tan, General Counsel for Chain Argos, um, the blockchain intelligence firm that brought you such hits as Binance's BUSD under collateralization. So with me as usual every week, um, John Ryder, our CEO and Chief Data Scientist. Um, we have, um, thanks for all the comments, keep them coming. We like those likes and subscribes. Slowly but surely we'll build up to 500 subscribers one day. And anyway, it doesn't matter. So what we have on the show this week, um, we're going to look into Franklin Templeton, um, their fund, mutual fund thingamabob on ETH and Arbitrum. So we'll look at that. John's got the the, the dish on that. Um, we'll look at the TBDC and WBTC and Bitco saga. Um, we'll, you know, surprise, surprise, we're going to be replaying some of the old hits. Um, and then finally, prediction markets. Um, John has some commentary on that, like, um, guys, do you just follow the news or what's going on? So, wait, let's just um, jump straight into it. We, we do have a bit of data for you this um, week. So if you're catching us on Spotify or wherever you receive your podcasts, um, you may want to also um, take a look at the YouTube video just so that you get a bite of that data. But before well, I will we... say these charts are pretty simple, so you can also just listen to the 30-second well, Yeah, maybe. We'll, we'll give you that narrative. I mean, we're not sportscasters, so, so who knows if we can get that right. But let's talk about Franklin Templeton and their um, sort of mutual fund... Um, thing that's supposed to sort of like run on a parallel system. Yeah, Tell so me about that. They've had a, a money market fund on, I believe it's Stellar and Polygon maybe? No, Stellar and Ethereum already, I think, um, for a little while that has some usage and there's a couple of other um, money market fund style providers with this sort of on-chain thing. Um, I guess what we're going to look at here is some usage data for a number of these funds. So Franklin Templeton has announced that they're extending this to be on um, Arbitrum. They're already on Stellar and Polygon. So, okay. So we'll look at utilization of a, a fair number of these things on Ethereum because there's the largest number of different ones on Ethereum. Uh, and the question is, you know, what's really going on here? Uh, the documentation for all of these funds makes clear that they're completely whitelisted KYC. So only whitelisted addresses can hold the funds. This is true for you know a dozen or so different things. I think we have eight or nine in our in our um, the data we're going to bring up in a second. Uh, and because they're you know completely whitelisted, actually the official records aren't even the blockchain records. They're in some other database. And the documentation tends to make very clear that if there is any problem with the blockchain records, they'll just reverse the transactions, cancel them, reissue the tokens, whatever. Um, and then it's all an exercise in finding out if the technology does actually offer some increased efficiency, which is a fair, fair, yeah, fair it's question. A reasonable way. So let's just go to some utilization data here for this stuff. Uh, I want that one, right? That's the one. Okay. So these are unique uh, to and from addresses on Ethereum for, I think it's nine different funds. So the BUIDL fund is the BlackRock fund. Um, there's all kinds of other city symbols. USYC, I think we talked about last week. USDY is a yield-bearing stablecoin. T-bill, uh, there's some of the Ondo Finance stuff on here, whatever. So what's important to note is that this collection of funds have been around now for about 18 months. Right? So it's a year and a half. You can see several of them have you know dozens of active addresses per month going back for a year and a half. It's pretty flat. Right? So if you've been around for 18 months and you have 20 or 30 monthly active users... I mean, that's a system, right? There's money in these things, but it's not, they're certainly not growing, right? I mean, you can see one fund appearing about a year ago, it's September 2023, and then a different fund appearing in January 2024, and they're, you know, on the board with about 100, 150 uh, users in a month, and then just dropping off. Um, these are not high velocity things. These are not used by a lot of people. Even if there's a hundred billion dollars in one of these things, if it's six addresses, you could do that on a spreadsheet, right? So I guess the point we'd like to make is many of these fund managers are launching these products saying they're going to explore if tokenization, blockchain usage, whatever, improves efficiency. Sure. None of them is allowing permissionless transfers Correct. for regulatory reasons. For obvious reasons. For, yeah, we, we're not we're <laughs> yeah. suggesting they should. We're yeah, just saying yeah. none of them's doing that. So none of them are exploring the benefits of permissionless transfers. Correct. They're saying, is this a more efficient record-keeping system? And it's a backup system because they're experimenting with it, sure. which is also fair. Well, and that's how you'd want to do it. I would like to assert that if you have 50 users per month for a year and a half, you can make no statements about whether or not it's more efficient. You can't have learned much of anything unless what you learned is it's catastrophically inefficient because one person could administer these funds on a spreadsheet 
20 minutes a day or you know probably less if there's very few transactions we can run transaction count reporting it's also tiny i don't know what anyone thinks they're learning here but something doesn't seem right you could run a trial forever i mean the incremental cost of this is is irrelevant i'm sure um but you can't declare any lessons learned oh we have 14 onboarded users for a year like we oh okay i mean there's no scale there's no challenge it's not necessarily anybody's fault uh <coughs> it also raises a question you know, if you view this as a marketing exercise for asset gathering you're not onboarding a lot of users so i don't know what's really going on um i mean the simplest explanation is that they have a partnership with some blockchain and they get paid to launch these products and that's why you see a spike on the month they launch and the number of active addresses just trails off it'll eventually hit zero and that's the end of it because the Fund manager doesn't actually care; they just cash the check, which is also fair enough. Fine, you know. Um, I just don't see how anyone's learning anything here. Well, maybe we are learning something. We're learning that maybe what people care about is the permissionless access and ability to to, to deal in these things. Oh, I think that we're learning that. Yeah, that these aren't uh, blockbuster hits. They're very, very light utilization without the permissionless transfers. Um, and I have yet to see anybody come out and declare that they've learned a tremendous amount from these exercises, which is good, because I would question if they had, in fact, learned something well, I mean, from I, processing hundreds of transactions for dozens of people over a year. But it's, what do we want? No KYC. When do we want it? Now. I, I, <laughs> the most cynical take on this is that all of this is pretty useless without the permissionless transfer. If one of these things would start to see significant increases in whitelisted addresses, utilization, value, all, all simultaneously, then that would be fascinating to look at. I'm not aware of any such case. Um, we talked a little bit about how Ondo Finance has whiteboarded, uh, whitelisted a platform that allows some interesting, less permissioned activities, and that, that was where the vast majority of the volume migrated. Um, so I wonder if that will continue to be the case. To my knowledge, none of the other major programs has whitelisted any platforms that themselves allow permissionless transfers. That's an Ondo-specific thing as of now. But um, I guess watch this space. I don't think you're going to see the BlackRock Fund deposited into a permissionless borrowing and lending protocol, but one never knows. But yeah, until these lines start going up, I don't know what people are going to learn, nor do I have a good sense for how long banks are willing to spend money on this stuff without and I guess if it return. doesn't cost all that much then you know why not just give it a go I mean look that's an answer uh, running a publishing a couple of smart contracts and having a guy track 20 uh, a guy or gal whatever, an employee track 20 ownership things on a, on a, a or AI <laughs> maybe I guess yeah if you can reverse it if there's yeah. errors just let the AI go loose <laughs> alright so um, shifting gears a bit um, TBDC WBDC and BitGo you'll know from what's been happening in the news that I think it was Maker uh, decided that because WBTC is going off the reservation um, they're not going to allow them uh... well, okay we can talk about the reservation maybe first a little bit so WBTC on Ethereum um, and a couple of other Ethereum whatever related networks is the largest wrapped Bitcoin provider and the way that works roughly we've talked about this before BitGo Singapore is a custodian there's some kind of a consortium you deposit Bitcoin on a Bitcoin address BitGo custody and then they issue wrapped Bitcoin tokens on almost entirely on Ethereum I think it's over 99% that's on Ethereum uh, the stuff's in BitGo custody it's fine they only charge fees for minting and burning of tokens, you know, wrapping and unwrapping. Um, not huge fees. And the nature of Bitcoin is such that most of these are very large transactions. There aren't that many transactions, and it's not a very high fee business because there's not a lot going on, right? Here's $500 million worth of Bitcoin, wrap them, moving on. Right? You do that a couple times, you got a lot of TVL, it's fine. It's not like there's people wrapping 0.2 Bitcoin back and forth all the time they're collecting fees on. They've announced that they're going to be transferring the setup to a new multi-party operation based out of Hong Kong and a BitGo International setup. Um, and then, yeah, it's Maker kicked off because the announcement made clear that it would be a three-way operation involving BitGo, Justin Sun, and the Tron Foundation. Apparently those are separate things somehow. Yeah, and then people freaked out. Um, I think freaked out is fair. Right? Freaked out is fair because, okay, a bit of history here. Um, Again, these stupid things. WBTC on Ethereum is not the same as WBTC on Tron. 
the same so they sound the same they look the same it's the same flavor as you know BUSD on Ethereum is not the same as BUSD on the BNB smart chain we've seen this movie before so naturally when now you're making an announcement to say we know WBTC is backed by what BitGo says and BitGo's respected yada 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 so oh sorry and historically uh, Poloniex Justin Sun Tron Huobi, HTX, various times, have been associated with the Tron-wrapped Bitcoin, and no one has ever had any clue where those reserves were kept. And there's been a number of rounds of reporting all over the place that none of the entities appear to have enough actual Bitcoin in any known address to back all of them. And anytime anybody's asked where they were, the answer was, what are you talking about? Of course, we're fine. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an open pit mining operation uh, that they have in, in Australia. They're in somewhere. Australia under the. They're all in yeah. Australia. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's why people started freaking out because one of the people now involved in this has a history of being associated with nebulous backing wrapped Bitcoin. They may be wrapped, whatever, but it's not clear where they are. But you can see, uh, of course, how it could be confusing if they have the same name and they're on different blockchains, and then now they're coming together when the worlds collide. Yes. So, so obviously people would freak out and necessarily so because now something with nebulous backing and something with what is backing that we know about um uh and and now so let's just take a look well yeah so there's been okay we'll look at some flows in a second um so the bitgo i think it's the cto a uh, ceo got involved in some maker uh governance forum discussions about this because the maker people were talking about booting wbgc as, as collateral for die issuance the concern being if it turns out that these are merged with nebulous backing Tron WBTC, people don't want to be associated with that in that currently we think our dollars are backed by 100% real Bitcoin. And as we've talked about again many times on this podcast, the difference between I have 100% confidence in my product and I have 99% confidence in my product is a lot larger than the difference between 99, 98, 99, 95, or even in some cases 95 and 50%. Right, I 100% believe the tokens are there versus I'm not sure. People want nothing to do with that. And the conversation did not go particularly well. Um, relatively straightforward questions regarding what's the legal entity, what's the license, who are the owners, directors, shareholders, whatever. We're met with vague comments about how it's all fine and the need for an NDA and whatnot. Um, this has been rolling on for a bit. And in fact, there's some protos reporting subsequent to the conversation that the Hong Kong entity that BitGo will be handing over to um, it's not allowed to have any shareholder over 20%, so it has five 20% shareholders that are all seemingly shell companies in the British Virgin Islands registered to the same address. Again, this is per protos reporting, although the document is Hong Kong government, you know, whatever, verified. Um, and that the uh, one of the two directors of the business is the same uh, Yi Ying Jiang, yeah. who signs the Tecterix TUSD attestations and apparently has nothing to do with Justin Sun, even though he just popped up and started having allegations of involvement with True Dollar and the rest of it around the same time that the Asia-based conglomerate Tecterix that she ran that nobody had ever heard of uh, came on the scene, bought control. So it's, it's certainly suspicious, and that he's even named explicitly as one of the three parties, right? So there's concern about that. Um, and I, I, this is an ongoing story. We're not actively reporting it so i'm sure we're you know 12 hours behind of what the current state of things is but there have been discussions about exactly how they're going to split up the multi-party control and the rest of it um, so we'll see how that goes so what we'd like to do here a little bit of data so this is um tbtc which is a different wrapped bitcoin product on ethereum it's another major such as it is and wbtc which is the dominant one and you may not even be able to see the TBTC flows here. So these are monthly WBTC volumes on Ethereum in units of Bitcoin, right? So this million is a million Bitcoin. So I'm just going to disable WBTC. You can see the TBTC has been growing lately, but um, what's that for about a year? But it's up to thousands a month in volume. And, you know, here's a, <laughs> this is doing over a million a month in volume. That's a huge difference. It's going to take a long time for that to, to equalize. And yanking this thing, people being concerned about this thing, is going to be a huge problem. And it's not clear that any of these other protocols is ready to absorb that kind of usage. This is um, active sender and receiver addresses. And you'll see you're looking in tens of thousands for a couple of years now on WBTC. Maybe you can see the TBTC numbers down at the bottom. But you're looking at similar to the money market funds we just talked about, you know, dozens and then hundreds here. So it's definitely growing. It's definitely growing. 
but the time it's going to take to go from 400 to 20,000, you know, we will see. Uh, somebody's going to get a lot of inflows, possibly, or something catastrophic is going to happen. It's not going to be a great scene one way or another. Uh, it's interesting to watch. You know, this is, again, um, it's the Mark Twain thing. It's not what you know that isn't so. It's what you thought you knew. that just, it's what, it, Something the, of that. The problem is when you're convinced something is true and it turns out that that's false, right? That's the problem. Um, and, yeah, if it turns out that WBTC gets merged in with something and people are forced to recognize that it may not be properly backed, right? Because the Tron thing's always been a little bit weird, um, and we don't know. But it's not clear where that flow is going to go. Um, the BitGo custody of Bitcoin are correct. Yes. Whether you're going to go from something that's nebulously backed and 100 backed, merge them together and get like a 50-50 backing for the whole thing, or you who could, knows? You, I mean, um, we, you know, it, it has been alleged that when um, Justin took over the uh, HTS, HTX exchange and then he took all the USDT and he filled it with his version of USDT, um, oh, the staked USDT, that whole yeah, saga, yeah. Yeah. which that again, it's saga. the money just basically managed. Yeah, but but that so again, we're not saying that that's what happened, but those were the allegations. These, but, so if these concerns lead to the ejection of these types of wrapped Bitcoin from the major borrowing and lending protocols on Ethereum, you're going to really see a schism in the system, right? Because Tron, WBTC, is trusted and is used as Bitcoin and is totally fine. On the Ethereum side, you can tell that people are extremely unhappy about the involvement of that group freaking out and talking about ejecting the token. Those groups, whatever different communities, groups of people they are, clearly have different views on the reliability of these service providers. And if the Ethereum level of concern creeps over to Tron, stuff would collapse. Similarly, if the Tron products are pushed onto Ethereum, some of those Ethereum products may collapse because people no longer have confidence in them. And be- that, that difference is going to be... Uh, Sort it out one way or another. Yeah, so you can just look to the HTX thing uh, for precedent. Like, if suddenly all the the wrap BTC you have gets like okay, it's, it still says WBTC on, on the on on the hood, but if you check ben- beneath the hood and you see what's in the engine, the engine is a wrapped version, but it's on the Tron blockchain, which then has a backing, which is uh. no, you, you're yeah, I definitely envisage a scenario in which a few months from now the new WBTC operator out of Hong Kong announces that they're going to hold their reserves on Tron wrap Bitcoin because they're less expensive. And then the Ethereum side people, you know, Maker, Compound, Aave, the, the standard large Ethereum DeFi services all just completely lose it because we're not, we're not interested in pledging collateral. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that's not a thing that they've historically been comfortable with, nor have they been exposed to. Those DeFi <laughs> ecosystems are really very separate, yeah. very separate. Uh, All right, so finally... Well, other than Tether, really, nothing connects Tron activities and Ethereum activities. They don't, they don't cross... Yeah. Uh, you don't cross streams. It's really just... To, okay. So, um, you, next, the next and final bit, what are you going to talk about the, today's uh, prediction markets? Oh, uh, yeah. So, prediction markets is pretty funny. So, we'll give people a longer history on some of this. So, prior to about 15 years ago, sports gambling in the United States was... Other than some specific in casino, there was no online. All this stuff was banned. Online poker, whatever. Lots of stuff was just not not permitted for a very long time. However, in some of the rest of the world, uh, most famously a lot of the, the British Isles, uh, Ireland, the UK, whatever, there's lots of spread betting stuff forever. Uh, Patty Power and other kinds of betting. You bet on sports. You could bet on politics. You could bet on all kinds of things. Uh, it was not legal for Americans in the United States to use those platforms. It's legal for people offshore to use them. And gambling of all sorts is banned in a lot of the world. More used to be banned than is now, but whatever. These licensed uh, bookies, spread betting operators, casino, whatever operators in a lot of the world have historically had, you know, they're highly regulated, pretty good practices. They won't onboard people. They can't, whatever, fine. There are shadier operations, Caribbean, doesn't matter. Now, there was betting, I remember very clearly 20 years ago, active betting on U.S. election outcomes on some of these offshore platforms. I remember sitting in the office in Tokyo watching the 2004 election results coming in and the price is gyrating on the screen. It didn't work then either, right? These are not great ways of predicting close elections, right? The wisdom of crowds, and this is documented in the economics literature, is often very good at sort of sorting out problems that have a definite answer 
But if three months out, it's 50-50 who's going to win an election, the, <laughs> it, this, there isn't a known answer that you just need to go work out. Right? In the case of the um, uh, bush Kerry in 2004, it was not clear back and forth what was happening. It was a bit of a roller coaster, even to some extent, near the end. So the numbers were oscillating. If you see something converge slowly to an answer as you approach the observation date, Maybe you believe that system works. If you see it oscillating wildly, like why, the, uh, only one person is going to win, right? It, it, if your prediction of that is flipping back and forth all the time, you don't have a stable prediction mechanism. Anyway, this has existed forever. People have been able to bet on this forever. Uh, the U.S. legalized a lot of forms of online gambling yeah. over the last 15 years. And that's why this is coming up again. Um, Still, the offshore operators couldn't onboard Americans, but they, you know, in the UK, this is super common. People spread bet on all kinds of things all the time. I remember when this was done on SMS before there were smartphone apps, you calling your bookie the legal version, not the, you know, mafia movie version bookie. Um, yeah, the, the U.S. is experimenting with that. The U.S. has historically had a fairly restricted view on what kinds of gambling are allowed. The sports stuff has been allowed more lately. I don't know. I'm not sure that allowing American domestic betting on politics is such a horrible idea only because people who really care have been able to do offshore betting forever. While you can't onboard yourself with your U.S. address, clearly it isn't that hard if you really care to go register with one of these things and sort it out properly. You need a company or an address, whatever. But these are things that people can, can arrange. Um, 100% legal. right? No allegations. It's legal. Um, so, yeah, there you go. It, it, it's not... I don't know why this is such a big deal. I don't get it. But it's funny to watch people's comments about how this is all totally new. None of this is new at all. It's been studied forever. There were NBER research papers around political betting decades ago because it's been around for a long time. I mean, the Internet allowed a lot of this stuff, right? Bookies weren't taking political bets in the 50s, <laughs> I, I don't think. I don't know. Um, anyway, they weren't doing it over the, you know, they were doing it over rotary phones or something. Um, so, uh, th th well, yeah, I mean, I guess you could uh, you could Western Union your, uh, you know, telex or yeah, telegraph your in Morse code your betting requests. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't know how that's going to fall out, but it's not. It sounds unhealthy, right? That you'd allow people to have more of a financial interest in these things. People have a financial interest in political outcomes anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so, so excited about. Yeah. And and to that end, I mean, how that's a big. Just because you again, this is the the concern with this space all the time. Just because you tokenize it doesn't make it a new thing. It's the same old thing, in a different wrapper. Yeah, I mean, permissionless transfer of value is you know the dollar stuff is is a bit different maybe, but in the case of this kind of betting, it is one hundred percent not new. These questions have come up repeatedly. Enjoy yourselves, right? I mean, there have been discussions historically. Uh, it was a whole thing. There's a book about this a long time ago about assassination markets so the idea was if you wanted to achieve certain political outcomes that involved you know murdering people right that you could do that and essentially launder the way you were paying people by taking bets on the day that some political leader would be killed and that was a way effectively of paying somebody to go do it for you you google assassin this is a thing that was studied the concept of oh well how could you repurpose one thing for the other uh, that's not a new idea at all um obviously the shooting of people part is illegal and certain and because of issues around that certain types of life insurance and whatnot we've talked about yeah. are not legal you can't just go buy fire insurance on a random building obviously the concern is that you would then go burn the building down right um but political stuff is a bit different you know i don't think patty power will allow you to place a bet on the day that a certain political leader is is killed that's not a thing that they would allow other stuff is permitted more complicated political stuff and whatnot um it seems like the real problems here are very much on the edges. There you no. go. On that note, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your comments. Keep them coming. We like them and we appreciate them very much. Um, and until we see you again next week, thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.